Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. <laughs> if you have story suggestions or ideas for the future, please feel free to comment below. And to all the listeners, please hit the like button. And I kindly ask that you please subscribe to the channel, if you haven't. That way, you'll never miss out on future scary stories. Like, subscribe, comment, and spread the love. Alright, now that the ritual is complete, please make yourselves comfortable, dim the lights, and begin. I wasn't the one that found Maddie. It was his wife, Elizabeth, back from a night shift at the hospital, eager to shed her scrubs and settle in for a long sleep. Instead, she walked into the bedroom to find Maddie sitting in a chair, his severed head in his lap. I would have preferred not to hear any further details about my brother's body, but when Elizabeth called me on the phone, hysterical, she couldn't help but overshare. Dark bruises covering his arms and legs, there was blood everywhere, soaking through his white t-shirt and striped pajama pants, pooling all around the wicker chair where he sat. The skin of his neck was frayed where it had been ripped apart almost like a popped balloon. The muscle, too, was stretched and torn, and the vertebrae stuck from the top of his neck hole like a white sleeping worm. Though we hadn't spoken much in the last few years, I was the only family Maddie had left. I caught the next flight to Boston and met up with Elizabeth at her parents' house. She started screaming as soon as she saw me. Or maybe she'd been screaming all day. Maybe I looked too much like my brother for her to handle. After a few hours, she calmed down enough to start saying a few words. I asked her if Maddie had been in any kind of trouble. He'd been reckless in his late teens and early twenties, selling drugs on campus. It was small time stuff, but he'd made a few bad enemies. Guys that put a real scare into him one night that made him get out of the game altogether. There was nothing like that, she said. He's totally clean. Got a good job clearing out old houses. Like when someone dies, he gets all the junk out, gets it sorted, helps sort out the junk from the antiques, takes a commission of the sales. Does he skim? I asked. Maybe someone felt cheated? She shook her head. He buys the stuff he likes, but it's always a fair price. Everybody loved him. Everybody. The cops investigated, of course. But there were no leads. No evidence of a break-in. No one with a grudge. It was like Maddie had twisted his own head off and set it in his lap. One of the detectives mentioned that more than half of murders go unsolved. It seemed this would be one of them. Weeks passed and I stuck around, trying to help Elizabeth put her life back together. Even after the police were done scouring her place, she refused to go back in. We hired some people to clean up the blood, but they told me there was only so much they could do. The hardwood in the bedroom would never give up that stain. Finally, it fell on me to go into the place and gather a few of Elizabeth's things. They were going to put it up for sale. She was still in pieces, planning to move back in with her parents. Probably permanently. I rented a truck and some basic tools, told her I'd get to work. Up until that point, I'd been staying in a cheap Airbnb nearby, but with Maddie's house reopened, I figured I could spend a few nights there while I packed up. When I mentioned the idea, Elizabeth gave me a weird look. You shouldn't stay there, she said. Why not, I asked, but she couldn't come up with a good reason. Of course, the day I got into the place, the first thing I did was head to the bedroom. I guess I just had to see it. The cleaners had clearly scrubbed the hell out of the place, but there was still a nasty stain in the center of the room. The mark was roughly circular and maybe three feet across, mostly gray but grew darker at the edges, almost black. Before she sold the house, Elizabeth would have to have the boards replaced, maybe put in carpeting, something. For a few seconds I just stood there, looking at the black circle, imagining my brother inside it permanently. Once I'd spent a few moments staring, I looked up from the stain, really taking the place in for the first time. Elizabeth hadn't been kidding about the antiques. All over the apartment were old hutches and paintings of ships at sea, sets of China and cigar store Indians. My brother had always had an eye for quality. The thing that really stuck with me, though, was a wood carving of an owl, which was standing right in the corner of their old bedroom. The thing was larger than life, 
coming all the way up to my shoulder, carved all of a single trunk of elm. It was one solid piece, save for a single, amber eye made of glass inlay. The other eye hole was empty, giving the odd impression that the carving was winking at you. The wood had been lacquered maybe a dozen times, leaving it with an uneven plastic sheen. Deep cracks ran through one of the wings, and the neck, and the base was discolored from water damage. It certainly didn't look lifelike, yet, somehow, it felt oddly alive. All afternoon as I packed boxes of Elizabeth's clothes and shoes, the eye followed me. I'm usually not the kind of guy to get spooked by anything, but I guess after everything that had happened to Maddie, I got kind of on edge. Eventually, I threw an old towel over the carving's head, covering the eye. It felt a little stupid, but it made me feel a little better. A few hours went by, a bunch of boxes got packed, and it started to get dark. My first instinct was to sleep in the living room away from the stain, and honestly away from the owl. I turned off the lights and stretched out on the couch, but it was old and lumpy, impossible to get comfortable. Maddie's mattress, practically brand new, lay untouched in the other room. Finally, after maybe an hour of rolling around, my back aching from the day of hard labor, I grabbed the blanket and headed for Maddie's old room, carefully walking around the black circle. As I tossed the blanket on the bed, I looked in the corner of the room at the owl carving. The towel I'd tossed over its head lay on the ground now. I wondered how it had fallen off. Maybe I'd been careless when I covered the statue in the first place. The eye caught the moonlight, watching. As stupid as it made me feel, I got up and walked over, picking the towel off the floor. As I did, I heard a distinct sound. Something like rat's feet skittering inside the owl. I jumped back halfway to the bed, still holding the towel in my hand. For a moment, I stared at the carving, daring it to move, waiting for another sound. Nothing. The whole time, though, even as I was watching it, the amber eye watched me. Slowly, I walked back to the carving and threw the towel over it. Then, I backed across the room to the bed, not quite realizing I was stepping through the black circle on the floor. Finally, I collapsed onto the mattress, curled under the blanket, and fell asleep. I woke to a cracking sound. At first, everything was still. Then, through the moonlit near dark of the room, I watched as the owl statue began to move. First, its left wing pushed out from inside. Then its right. The wood pushed out perhaps five inches, revealing something black and skeletal inside. It looked almost like the Transformers Maddie and I had played with as kids. Unseen robots pushing out through the plastic panels of a vehicle to reveal their hidden shiny bones. I lay transfixed as two thin black legs pushed out hidden panels near the owl's base. The black legs at least. They seemed like legs couldn't have been much wider than a curtain rod. They pushed all the way down to the floor. Then, the whole carving began to move toward me. The wood swayed on some unseen thing inside it some too thin creature wearing the wooden owl-like armor. I looked for a way out. I could have jumped through the window, but I was on the second floor, and the thing was moving too fast now anyway. As it reached the bed, it reached out, its thin black arms growing impossibly long, its hands flattening and growing wide like dinner plates. Then it placed them over my ears, and everything went black. I woke to find myself sitting on a wooden chair from the kitchen, the owl must have brought it in while I was passed out. It had placed me inside the black circle. I thought of Maddie, sitting here just like me, not that long ago. I tried to move, but the long black rods that I'd assumed were the owl's legs bound my ankles to the chair. Its hands still gripped my head, their grip only slightly more relaxed than when it had first grasped me. The carving itself stood only a few inches in front of me, though it fixed me with its amber eye. I could see now that the other eye hole was now open, revealing something black and moving inside. What are you? I asked, barely able to speak. I think it laughed. At least it sounded a little like a laugh. I'm not quite an owl, it said. Its voice was low, echoing out through the cracks in the owl's wooden shell. I'm not quite a person either. Some days I feel closer to bird, some days closer to man. But actually, I've been around long before owls ever flew. 
Of course, it continued. Owls are generally far less interesting than humans. They're basic creatures. Give them a moonlit night and a field full of frightened mice, and they'll be happy, so happy, every single time. For humans, nothing is ever enough. It clicked its tongue, then got quiet. But there is one area in which owls truly excel, which I have always admired, it said. They are fantastic at turning their heads. So much better than humans. It's an area where it's not even a competition, not even close. As it said this, I felt the pressure from its plate-like hands increase against my temples, and it turned my neck about 90 degrees to the right. Not enough to hurt exactly, but it was certainly uncomfortable. I thought of Maddie, his head twisted clean off and set carefully in his lap. Why are you doing this, I asked. Because as I said, humans are interesting, but also frustrating. Not to belabor the comparison to owls, but truly your eyesight is quite poor. And not just your night vision. Your ability to see yourselves is quite abysmal. Watching you with only one eye, I can see truths about you that you simply cannot face. What the fuck are you talking about? I screamed. It held a black finger to its beaks, shushing me. Please, it said. If you must scream, wait until you really, really must. Later in the game, it may be unavoidable. Game, I whispered. It's one of my own invention, though it's not too different than some human games. A little bit truth or dare. A little bit mercy. Mostly mercy. The rules aren't complicated. I'll be telling you some truths about your life. Unpleasant truths. Each truth will come with a bit of pain both mental and physical. When you've had enough, simply speak the word mercy and your pain will be over, and my head will be in my lap, I said. Very good, it said. I knew you were a smart one. In that case, it sounds like no further explanation will be needed. Except that I should add, the result of this exercise will be inevitable. You will eventually beg for mercy. Out of compassion, I'll go ahead and offer you an opportunity to ask for it right now, just to spare yourself the pain ahead. For a moment I considered the offer. It would be easy to let it simply do what it wanted, to give my head one great, final twist. That would be it. Nothing would hurt after that, but something in me wasn't ready to let go. No, I said, not yet. Deep from within the owl's wooden head, the dark thing looked out at me. Then. It seemed to nod. I felt its impossibly strong hands tighten around my head and began to turn it, perhaps ten more degrees to the right. It was definitely past the point of uncomfortable now, along with this physical pain. I'll be stating a truth that carries a similar amount of mental anguish, said the dark, thin thing. I would like to start by saying that you were never a good brother. As a boy, you were the golden child, taking all of your mother's love, allowing a narrative to develop that your brother was the eternal fuck-up. Though you pretended to be kind to him, secretly, deep down, you were happy to play the role of the favored son. Sometimes, it even made you happy to hear your mother ranting at him, refusing him meals as he cried in his room, knowing that his misdeeds only made you look all the better. No! I said, trying to wriggle my neck free. Is that what Maddie said? I was a good brother. After Mom used to tear into him, I'd go to his room, bring him snacks when she threw his dinner in the trash. I took care of him. The thing's hands tightened around my head, turning it ever farther. That happened once or twice, said the thing. It was little comfort to your brother. More often than not, he went to sleep hungry, well aware that no one loved him. Least of all you. I wanted to say more, but I knew it would only bring pain. I held my tongue. Even in adulthood, you let your brother flounder, it said. It would have been so easy to help him out with a few thousand dollars. You knew he was destitute, selling drugs to make ends meet. He would have blown that money in a week, I said. Might have gone on a bender, gotten himself killed. No, it shouted, growing angry at me now. You were selfish. You wanted to see him twist in the wind. You wanted to be superior. It twisted my neck five more degrees. I could feel the skin growing tight as it twisted. 
the muscles beneath straining against the black hands. Why are you even here? It asked. You never visited when he was alive. Perhaps it actually frustrated you to see him getting his life together. Or is it Elizabeth? You always felt she was too good for Maddie. But you always secretly had a little crush, didn't you? Maybe now that's he's dead. No, I said, and hot tears were starting to roll down my face. I was just trying to be a good brother, I swear. Too late! The thing shouted. Too late! It twisted my head again. I felt a wetness on my skin and wondered if I had begun to bleed. Mercy! The thing shouted. Simply say the word and this will all be over. Your brother suffered far less. I'm sorry, Maddie, I said, just talking into the dark. I'm sorry. I did my best. I really did love you always. Mercy, shouted the thing. Just keep going, I said. It'll be over soon enough, but I'll never ask for it. Never. As I said the words, the first rays of sun cut through the drawn shades. Where the rays struck the thing's hands, there was a smoky smell. Mercy quick, or it'll only hurt worse, shouted the thing. But there was a note of fear in its tone now. Go ahead then, I said. But it didn't. The sun shone more brightly. Slowly, the pressure on my temples began to ease. The black limbs withdrew. The owl began to back away into its corner. By the time dawn had fully flooded the room, the carving was back in place. That morning, I returned to Elizabeth's parents' house with a few boxes of her things. I must have looked pretty wrecked, because she asked how I was doing, a note of concern in her voice. I'm okay, I said, but I can't stay here anymore. I've got to get home. She nodded, understanding. I've been thinking about it, she said, and I think I can handle the rest. I've been leaning on you too hard. Suddenly, a wave of panic flooded through me. Promise you won't stay there, I said, bro, you move, promise. I would never, she said. I, even when Maddie was alive, I didn't like sleeping there. All those old antiques. I never liked the smell, but Maddie loved them, so. Thank you, I said, trying to stay composed, for being so good to him. She reached out and gave me a big hug. I know you two hadn't hung out much over the last few years, but Maddie always said you were there when he needed him, she said. Now I see what he meant. She looked over at my rental truck. There, in the bed, lay the wooden owl. Is that one of Maddie's? She asked. I was hoping you'd let me have it, I said. One last thing to remember him by. She shrugged. I've never seen it before. Maybe he'd just gotten it. Yeah, I said. Could be. I said goodbye and got in the truck. And then I drove. I headed out in the city, out where the urban sprawl gave way to some kind of forest, marked with a few sunny meadows. When I was satisfied that I'd reached the middle of nowhere, I stopped. I took the statue from the bed of the truck and dragged it out into a sunny field. All the while I heard the skittering sound inside. It was getting hot, toward afternoon, and I could tell the heat and light was affecting the thing inside. I knew the wood was full of little cracks. Some of them must have been big enough to let the light through. It's still only noon, I said, not quite the hottest part of the day. That'll be hours from now, maybe at three or four. I wonder if you'll make it that far. A small shriek emerged from inside the owl. I ignored it. Now over in the truck, I've got a saw, I continued. I could cut this owl shell of yours right in half and let the light take you. And I will. But first, I'm going to need you to ask for mercy. Uncle Wes was at it again. When I was eight years old, my mother predicted the exact time and date I would die. Yet she failed to predict the amount of times my siblings and I would be kidnapped by our eccentric uncle. Eccentric was a strong word. I preferred psycho. It wasn't unusual for me to spend my Friday night tied to my siblings inside my uncle's storage container. I was eight years old. I should have been at home watching cartoons or in bed. I won't say my family was normal, even if Uncle Wes didn't take us. The three of us would be accompanying our parents in their shady activities, as long as we stayed in the truck. However, Uncle Wes's monthly kidnappings had become an event. Get up, eat breakfast, go to school. Even when I knew it was coming, I still somehow fell for it. Uncle Wes's cartoon-like schemes to capture us were getting progressively more unhinged. 
Waking up was uncomfortable. My head felt stiff. My eyes glued shut. Swirling my tongue around my mouth, I could taste stale chocolate milk. According to mom and dad, if our mouths taste bad, our memories muddled. We are definitely drugged. I did have a semblance of a memory, though. I remembered the smell of leather car seats, my cheek uncomfortably glued to the window, my cousin hanging over the front seat as we were slowly driven into blanketed darkness. My sister's head was bouncing on my shoulder, my hand grazing the lock on the door. But I was so tired. Outside, darkness became light, and we were heading further and further away from what we knew. Home. There was chocolate milk in my lap. My brother curled up next to our psycho cousin. <clears throat> Immediately, my parents' training kicked in. Resisting the urge to groan, I inclined my head left and then right. I didn't even have to open my eyes to know where I was. The ice-cold temperature and unearthly silence was enough. When I was younger, the storage container was terrifying. A nightmare that haunted the back of my mind. At eight years old, however, I had been through this far too many times to be scared. My mouth felt thick and strange, and my memories were fuzzy. Head, torso, legs, arms, I'm okay. Moving my arms, I realized my wrists were restricted behind my back. Fee, my voice echoed. Are you okay? No, my sister grumbled. Leave me alone. The ropes tangled around our hands were tighter than usual. Rowan? He answered by knocking his head into mine. Ow. What did I say? Rowan exploded in a hiss. I told you so. I had to bite back a petty retort. He was right. Yes, I had fallen for an obvious trap, but this time it was easier to believe. I was in class when my elementary school principal strode into our classroom and announced both of my parents had been in a car accident. It's a trap. Rowan sat behind me, pencil lodged between his teeth. When I turned in my chair, he mouthed, It's Uncle Wes. Mom and Dad taught us from a young age to never trust adults. Even adults with kind eyes. Adults we were supposed to trust. Mom said the people in our town wore masks. And no matter how young I was, as a Delacroix, I would always be in danger. My brother knew this after learning the hard way. He befriended a kid with Pokemon cards. Initially only growing close to the boy to get a sparkly one. But he ended up actually liking him. The kid invited him to hang out at his place. And my oblivious and naive brother ended up a hostage. It turns out even innocent bystanders will go to the extreme to get cash. The mayor had a target on our heads and Rowan was practically a golden goose. If underground thugs wanted his mercy, then they had to bring him a Delacroix head. I rode with Mom on the way to the kid's house. Back in a moment, honey. Mom calmly climbed out of the car. She was gone for maybe a minute. I heard one singular gunshot before she was yanking open the car door, my brother in her arms. Mom wasn't scared or in a rush to get away. She reprimanded Rowan for breaking her number one rule, and then cranked up the radio. After that incident, he trusted no one. Not even the lunch ladies. Rowan shot me a glare, but I was already trembling. My teacher's words sending my stomach twisting into knots. Don't fall for it, idiot. Rowan, that is a terrible thing to say, the teacher scolded him. Stand up. Rowan stood up, dragging his feet. How much did our uncle pay you? The teacher looked taken aback. I'm sorry, what? Rowan stuck out his tongue. You heard me. How much did Uncle Wes pay you to kidnap us? Mrs. Carver's eyes darkened. I appreciate your vivid imagination, young man, but you are being ridiculous. The boy folded his arms stubbornly. Mom and Dad wouldn't just get into a car accident. If you think I'm going to believe that, you must be really stupid. Mrs. Carver shook her head. Stand up, Mr. Delacroix, and leave my classroom. Why? So I can get snatched by my uncle? The teacher finally snapped, her cheeks going red. She pointed to the door. Now! Despite Rowan being very vocal that the school was selling us out to our psycho uncle, we had no choice but to follow the adult's instructions. I was told to stand up, while my brother was gently pulled from the classroom. According to our principal, a family friend would be waiting for us. I didn't want to follow him. Part of me already knew what would be waiting for us, and there was nowhere to run. The police were under the mayor's control, and the mayor wanted our family's heads on pikes. Rowan skulked behind me, keeping his distance. Look! My brother shoved me, pointing to Principal Carver's bulging back pocket. 
I bet that's hush money. I pushed him back. Shh. Nine times out of ten, Rowan was being dramatic. This time, however, my brother was infuriatingly right. Our cousin greeted us. Rowan grumbled a bad word, and I stiffened up. His hand reached out for mine, but I was frozen. When we twisted around to run back into school, a scary amount of adults surrounded us, all of whom worked for our uncle. Hey, guys! His son patted the truck, an evil smile plastered on his lips. There was a strange man next to him. I guessed he was the owner of the car, unless our eight-year-old cousin was an underage driver. I didn't think Uncle Wes would send his son to capture us. Maybe he'd moved up the ranks. His smile brightened when I dropped my backpack. Wanna go see Mommy and Daddy? All I had to see was my sister's head against the window. Her eyes were shut, a bruise blossoming on her right temple. Time seemed to stop, and at that moment, I forgot my mother's words. Don't panic. Never show them you are scared. Everything I learned from my parents bled away, and I was just a scared kid. I did panic, letting out shriek. Every kidnapping was closer to Uncle Wes finally snapping and killing us for real. I took three steps back in an attempt to run back inside the school, only for grimy arms to wrap around me, violently pushing me into the back of the truck. I was used to being a target which had aged me well above the age of eight, but this time it was different. Uncle Wes was never this desperate, this violent. This felt too real, like the kidnappings our parents warned us about. When I screamed, slamming my fist into the window, something collided with the back of my head, and my face hit the window, pain exploding in a supernova. When the truck flew forwards, my body slammed into the pain with a thunk. Leaning over the seat, grinning, my cousin snatched the chocolate milk, pierced it with the straw, and handed it over. Drink. He giggled with a tone that told me I didn't have a choice. Try it, it's super chocolatey. In the corner of my eye, my brother was being shoved into the front seat. The last thing I remember is taking the tiniest sip. It did taste good, but then the world started to spin off kilter. Rowan slowly tipped into the window, eyes flickering, chocolate milk pooling from his seat. Presently, I could still feel the impact gritting my teeth. That explained my headache. I had grown used to the freezing cold temperatures, the scratchy rope wrapped around my wrist, and the duct tape plastered over my mouth. It was part of being a Delacroix child, and I knew that. The Delacroix were known as the infamous crime family in our town. Mom and Dad were ex-CIA gone rogue, the two of them deciding to take over our town's underground. Those words had been drilled into me since I was a little kid. They made sure to reiterate that they were not good people, and sometimes they did very bad things. But they still loved us, which made us targets. The closest we came to being compromised was Elena Mara, a dangerous name, and an old flame of our mother's. Elena wanted mom for unfinished business, so she targeted my siblings. Luckily, I was sick that day. You would be surprised how corrupt our town is, where it's normal to hand kids over for a decent chunk of cash. Especially when everyone wanted the Delacroix family dead, Rowan and Ophelia were snatched on their way home from school. Elena and her cronies manipulated the bus driver to hand them over in broad daylight. The two described being shown a scary video which made their head hurt. After multiple tests and isolating the two of them for two days, Mom came to the conclusion that Elena was trying to scare her. The videos were just that. Videos. Nothing shady. But our parents definitely kept an eagle eye on my siblings for weeks after that. Mom didn't like people fucking with her family, however. Even if they were old flames trying to attract her attention, she left after dinner one night with a smile, tucking her knife into her jeans. Mom returned holding a single index finger, a wedding ring still attached. However, it was our own blood who was out for ours. Uncle Wes was Dad's ex-partner in crime until he met Mom. Dad tried to kill his own brother, and Wes built his own business, with his prime goals to take over the business and destroy our father's life. We were part of that, so of course his three children were caught in the crossfire, which meant every month or so we would find ourselves once again at the mercy of Uncle Wes. The thing about Uncle Wes is, though, he's all bark and no bite. Uncle Wes was more of a doofenshmirtz than a joker. When we were younger, Uncle Wes was a little more lenient. Instead of a storage container, we would be held inside his grotty kitchen, handcuffed to the wall. However, he did provide us with cookies and juice boxes. Dad's main fear was Uncle Wes influencing us to come over to his side of the family. But again, Wes was one big goof. He was a large man with a pot belly, two chins, and a grotty mustache. 
Imagine Santa, but mix him with a cryptid and a criminal. He had abnormally large eyes and yellow teeth, a permanent grin splitting his mouth apart. It was supposed to be intimidating, and it was to others, sure, but we already knew he wasn't a threat. Wes was fully mute, so he let his scar speak for him. I found myself wondering if he did it to himself, or maybe the perpetrator was my father. Uncle Wes wore his scar like a trophy, and he was right too. That thing was grotesque. I had witnessed some of his executions, the victims begging for their lives. Unlike my parents' way of taking care of people, his tactics were a lot more brutal. Uncle Wes didn't say a word which was scarier choosing a baseball bat wrapped in spikes or an axe. He always made a mess. My eyes were blindfolded before I could see the real grisly stuff. Though all I really needed to hear was the crunch of the thick blade slicing through the skull, the screaming and begging coming to an abrupt halt. Thump! The body hitting the ground, always stomach first. If I really concentrated, I could hear the wet splash of blood seeping out of them. When the blindfold was removed from my eyes, one of his cronies would be cleaning up blood and bits of skull with a scarlet mop. I think I was desensitized to blood at this point, or the color red in general. I just pretended it was a whole lot of cherry juice, but sometimes I would crack, especially hearing the crack of a gunshot or the sickening squish of a knife penetrating flesh. Fee stayed very still and didn't speak, and Rowan cried. He was getting better at tolerating it, but my brother really hated blood. Uncle Wes used that to his advantage, so we always had a front row seat at every execution, the three of us awkwardly tied back to back. We didn't have to see to get traumatized. It was what we heard, and the inability to know what was going to happen next. If our uncle's axe was swinging our way, it wasn't always Uncle Wes who carried out executions. I grew up watching my cousins doing his dirty work. As Wes's children, they were automatically part of the family business. Liam was our older cousin, by three months, a scowling redhead with his own scar, self-inflicted with a box cutter. I watched it happen. I also watched him almost faint from blood loss. Maddie was the younger, deadlier cousin, who was more terrifying than her criminal parents put together. My younger cousin reminded me of a snake, narrowed eyes and pursed lips like she was spitting venom. I watched her slit a man's throat for getting her name wrong. He called her Madeline. Compared to his sociopathic daughter and unhinged son, Uncle Wes was one big marshmallow. But that didn't make him less of a threat. I had no doubt he would have zero problem brutally killing us once we were of age. After all, being a kid is a luxury. Nobody, not even the big scary criminals, can lay a finger on you. I'll start by saying neither I nor my siblings were born into the Delacroix family. We were adopted together from the same children's home at the age of five years old. I remember being transfixed by the woman who would become my mother a beautiful redhead appearing in front of me with a smile I trusted. She was already hand in hand with Rowan and Ophelia. Rowan was a celebrity at Bolivia House. At least, his parents were. The other kids were obsessed with finding out who his real parents were, trying to match his mop of dark curls to any famous movie stars. Despite choosing to stay anonymous, Rowan's bio parents sent him cash and toys every month, which skyrocketed him up the orphanage popularity ladder. He didn't want cash, though. I would regularly overhear him asking the house mother if he could meet them. It was always a stern-sounding no. When he asked why, Rowan got the same answer. Because they don't want you. To a five-year-old, that's like telling them the world is ending. Ophelia was the troublemaker who regularly ended up in the house mother's office after scribbling on the walls and filling the bathtub with frogs. Mom said she fell in love with the two of them when she first walked in, witnessing them play fighting in the main hallway. Unbeknownst to our mother, they were actually fighting, trying to rip each other's hair out. Rowan had the newest Pokemon game, and Ophelia wanted to play. The boy had anger problems, and Ophelia didn't take no for an answer. Chaos ensued. Rowan and Ophelia were known to get on each other's nerves, so adopting them together was... a choice. I tried to break up their fight, getting shoved over in the process. Mom appeared in the doorway and asked if the three of us wanted to go home with her. In our mother's words, that was it. From the moment I saw you, I knew you were my children. The rest was history. Now we had parents, and those parents happened to be part of a town infamous crime family. 
Maybe that's why our cousins hated us. We weren't technically Delacroix blood. When the storage container opened with a loud groan, I knew it was Liam. My cousin always announced his presence by whistling. His footsteps unnerved me, dancing towards us. Light seeped inside the storage container, illuminating his face. Liam was eight years old, skinny, and did not resemble his father or little sister in the slightest. He was a sandy blonde, while the two of them were freckled redheads. Liam's face reminded me of pizza, specifically pepperoni. His bright yellow Adventure Time sweatshirt really upped the intimidating factor. Rowan scoffed, muttering something under his breath. My cousin's head snapped up, eyes narrowing. I'm sorry, did you say something, Orphan? Wow, I've never heard that one before. Liam curled his lip. I said, what did you say? I knew Rowan wouldn't hold back. He surprised me with a snort. I said, aren't you a little tooled for Adventure Time? You need to clean your ears out if you can't hear me. My brother laughed, and to my surprise, Ophelia joined in nervously. Isn't your father part of a big criminal gang, and you're watching cartoons? When Rowan leaned forward, I was thrown back. I could hear the smirk in my brother's voice. Shouldn't you be watching adult TV shows by now? Liam's mouth stretched into a terrifying grin. Instead of responding, he pulled something from his pocket, and I felt Rowan stiffen. Playtime was over, and now we were playing like our criminal parents. An unwelcome shiver skittered down my spine. I saw the flash of silver, and then the curve of the blade. My father is out on business, Liam announced, casually spinning the handle between his fingers. So I figured why not play with my favorite cousins. I found my voice, pulling at my restraints. No wonder this particular kidnapping wasn't like the others. It wasn't even Uncle Wes who took us. Wait, you were the one who paid our teacher? The boy nodded, taking a step towards us. He was waving the knife around too much. If he wasn't careful, he was going to stab himself in the eye. I had a little help from my dad's friend, he said casually, flashing me a smile, his eyes shining with glee. Liam was trying way too hard to be his father. It was painful to watch. The asshole definitely wanted a matching scar. Do you want to guess what I'm going to do to my favorite cousins? Force us to watch a kid's cartoon? Rowan mumbled. When my brother let out a sharp hiss, I realized our cousin had kicked him hard enough to knock the breath from his lungs. Twisting my head, I glimpsed my cousin's shadow lunging forwards. He kicked him again and again and again, until Rowan was wheezing, spitting blood. Liam didn't stop until my brother was silent. I could still hear his breaths, but they were labored, his clammy hands trembling. Nope, Liam laughed. Try again, Ophelia squeaked, and I sensed the impact of his shoe protruding into her gut. She let out a startled breath, her head knocking against mine. I was next. Mom told me how to disguise pain and pretend it didn't exist but she was yet to train my mind to think like hers. I felt weak, pathetic. As a Delacroix daughter, I was too young to learn how to fight back. That's what Dad said, so I had to take it. The first kick wasn't that bad. I sucked in my tummy and took a deep breath. The second kick knocked it all out of me, and I understood what pain really was. Stubbing my toe was not pain. Falling down the stairs was not pain. Even breaking my arm was not pain. Pain was endless a cruel, wrenching sensation of my body being battered. It was relentless, and a new word blossomed into my mind. I had never known it myself, only heard my parents express it. Agony. Agony was intentional, and every kick was meant to hurt. I started to scream, my cry choking into sobs, but I didn't have enough breath to scream, breath to cry. The third kick was aimed at my face, bursting my nose on impact, my head hanging. The world seemed to slow down and suddenly all I knew was pain. All I knew was reality jerking left to right. The salty taste of blood dribbling down my chin. I was barely conscious when my cousin grabbed my ponytail and wrenched my head forward. The world was spinning. The sudden prick of his knife grazing the curve of my throat sent my mind into overdrive. Your parents took something special from my uncle. Liam murmured jerking my head left and right, his fingernails digging into my chin. The boy was studying me, sticking his fingers into my mouth and prying it open. When I bit him, he cocked his head confused. Huh, that's weird. Liam shuffled back, tightening his grip on the knife. You don't smell of the pit. He tilted his head, a dark twinkle in his eye. 
Why? He prodded at my eye, and this time I let out a hiss, lunging forward. Liam only had to remind me of his weapon. Holding it up with one hand, he muffled my shriek with the other. Shh, you're annoying me. Liam stroked the blade just like his father, copying Uncle Wes's unnerving grin. Answer correctly, dearest cousin, and maybe I won't slice your throat open. He slowly removed his hand. Are we clear? I could only nod, spluttering out a sob my mother would be ashamed of. Liam pressed the blade to my throat, teasing the teeth. Ah, uh, his question didn't fully register because by then, heavy footsteps were outside. I saw Liam's lips form the words, but his voice never hit my ears. No, no it did. I just couldn't recall the words. They were there one minute and gone the next. Liam definitely spoke, and I could have sworn his eyes pricked with fear. My psycho cousin was never scared. The, uh, ocean waves was all I could hear enveloped in white noise. Before I knew what was happening, my mother was wrenching the knife from my cousin and screaming at him. When he cried out, she pulled his hands behind his back and shoved him to the ground. Maddie floated behind her, a wicked smile on her freckly face. The world made sense again. Tipping my head back, I watched my mother calmly restrain Liam. Meanwhile, my younger cousin was laughing in the corner. If there was anything Maddie loved more than terrorizing us, it was seeing her brother get his ass kicked. Dad was in front of me, cradling my face. His fingers tiptoed across my bruises, soothing them. It's okay, sweetie, I'm here. He moved to untie Rowan, gently lifting my knocked-out brother onto his back. Ophelia shakily got to her feet, swiping at her teary eyes. I knew she was trying to hide them, but was failing miserably. Mom's eyes found mine, and I knew what she was going to say. She was ashamed of her children who could not fight back. If the Delacroix kids were seen as weak, then we would be targets. Lifting my sister into the air, my mother pressed her face into Ophelia's curls. I think you're old enough to learn, she said, how to be a Delacroix. My mom's words sounded like ocean waves crashing onto the shore. I could still feel the blade stuck to my throat, teasing a death I knew wouldn't come for a while, because I already knew when I was going to die, and it wasn't inside a grotty storage container at eight years old at the mercy of my psycho cousin. I don't know if my mom was a psychic, or maybe it was mother's intuition. Halfway through an episode of Spongebob Squarepants, just a few weeks prior, she ruined our lives with four words. You're going to die. Mom stepped in front of the TV and switched it off, so I knew it was serious. I snapped to attention, and Rowan, who was sitting next to me frowning at his Pokemon game, lifted his head, blinking. Mom might have looked like she was in casual mom mode, her hair still damp from a shower, peanut butter smudged on her lip, but she wasn't smiling, her hands planted on her hips. Listen to me very carefully, she said, her expression softening. The three of you are going to die. She said it so casually I almost giggled. Ophelia knelt on the floor with a book on her lap, looked up a pen in her mouth. Rowan laughed before disguising it with a cough. What? I thought mom meant that we were too weak, that one day, an enemy of our family was going to succeed in killing us. No, mom knew the exact time and date we were going to die. I was going to die at 18 years old, 10 years away, and yet I suddenly felt like every minute and second mattered. The world looks different when you're told your death is close. The word felt tangled and nodded. Murder. We were going to be murdered in what she guessed was a planned attack, but she didn't know who our killer was. Mom broke down pleading with us to understand that she and our father were hunting down our future killers, and she promised nothing was going to happen. Squeezing my hand so tight my mother's smile was watery, but I tugged my hand away. All of the breath sucked from my lungs. There was always a but. But we haven't found them yet. Her voice didn't sound real. Rowan started shouting, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. Mom said the date as if it was concrete, like it was going to happen. 0305 2024 Rowan and Ophelia were scheduled to die at 4.13 p.m. and 4.17 p.m., while I would die 40 minutes later at 4.50 p.m. How do you even know this? Rowan argued. She didn't reply, only hugging him instead. Mom was confident that she could turn us into killers in 10 years, because the only way of living past 18 was killing our future killers. So after the Liam incident, we had no choice. Our brutal training regime began. I can't say I agreed with it at the beginning. Get up. Eat breakfast, 
Go to school. Train. Eat dinner. Train. Go to bed. Do it all over again. Dad taught us self-defense classes in the morning, and Mom led weapons training in the afternoon. Our house was big enough, so in the morning after breakfast, Dad cleaned out the basement, converting it into a makeshift training gym. I had to learn how to take a punch to the face. Dad was gentle in his tactics, only growing strict when we weren't pulling our weight and awarding us with candy. We started with plastic dummies. I had to hit them as many times as possible. Then Dad paired me up with Ophelia. Whoever pinned their opponent first was awarded extra ice cream for supper. Initially, neither of us wanted to fight each other. I felt awkward, my feet sinking into the mat. Ophelia tried to kick me and tripped over her own leg. So Dad tried a different tactic. Insult each other, Dad said from the sidelines. No bad words, just air out your opponent's flaws. Call her the B-word, Rowan shouted with a laugh. No, there is no reason for using bad words, our father said. I want you to get used to fighting back. Start with using words. You always use your toothbrush with your gross mouth. Ophelia spoke up with a squeak. And you use my toothpaste. Her words gritted my teeth together. You snore. I retorted, my cheeks heating up. You sound like a pig. At first I barely felt the sharp impact of her hand slapping my face. I think it was shock. Before our father clapped his hands. That's right, Fee. Now I want you to use your hands. I could barely control myself when I hit back, this time shoving her to the ground. Ophelia jumped to her feet and kicked me in the stomach. That's too harsh, Dad said. No kicking. Copy what I demonstrated. Ignoring him, I kicked Ophelia in the leg and was immediately grounded. He reiterated his rules. I don't want you to fight each other. I want you to take each other down. So that's what we did. It took months of training for me to be able to take my sister down. Then my brother. And after a few years, I was pinning my own father. Our parents would pay friends to sneak up on us. Expect the unexpected was what they nailed into our heads. Our murderers could be anyone and anywhere. As a kid, I failed. I jumped into a woman's car posing as our great aunt Helen, only for her to drug my apple soda and take me right back home, where my awaiting mother chastised me for being naive. In my defense, I did have a great aunt Helen, and this woman did look like a Helen. When I stepped into our kitchen at 13 years old, tired from school and training, mom was baking cookies. She twisted around, pivoting on her heel, pulling her gun from her apron. Bang, she said, pointing it at my head. I just killed you, honey. I was already struggling to grab my own. Bang! Mom said again. I killed you again. Mom, wait! I was too slow, my brain foggy. Three shots in the head, Poppy. She said in a sing-song. Your brains are currently splattered all over the walls. You can't kill me three times! I said, struggling to find the right trajectory. Mom lowered her weapon when I mimed shooting her in the face. That's how fast it is, sweetie. Bad people do not hesitate. She shot around into the window and I had to stop myself from flinching. Why are you hesitating? Because you're my mother. Mom sighed, turning back to her cookies, swapping her gun for a heart-shaped cookie cutter. How was school? Fine. Dropping my weapon on the counter, I grabbed apple juice from the refrigerator. However, after remembering my brother drugging himself yesterday in a poison exercise, I slowly put it back. I did get better at training. After years of the exact same regime, I stopped feeling human, more like a soldier. Mom was right. She was slowly and successfully turning us into killers. When she brought real people into target practice, I stopped seeing them as humans. I stopped crying when the bullet made an impact. I stopped slamming my hands over my mouth, my gun trembling in my grasp. Targets would bleed, and I ignored them. The only thing that mattered was the magnum molded into my palm my index inching towards the trigger. I remembered holding my first gun at the age of eight. My hands were clammy and clumsy, struggling to get a proper grip. Mom told me that person could have been my killer, so I wasn't allowed to hesitate. My hands were not allowed to shake. By the age of 16, I used every waking minute to train. Rowan took me down in a self-defense exercise, only for me to leap onto his back and rip out his hair. Dad called it fighting with emotion. He told me to take a walk around the yard and come back when I was less agitated. I knew my brother and sister's weak spots at this point, but they knew mine too. I threw a punch, aiming for his neck to destabilize him, but he was already tracking my moves, 
narrowed eyes drinking all of me in. With a single kick to the groin area, I was lying on my back staring at the ceiling, and Dad was shouting at me to try again. I did, this time pinning him. But he was fiercely competitive, knocking me back onto my ass. The only thing that destabilized him was making him laugh. We all had our respective talents. Rowan was our best fighter, accompanying Dad on assignments as the brawn. There were a surprising number of teen gang members, and as a 14-year-old, Rowan easily brought them to their knees, cementing himself as a Delacroix. I'm pretty sure his obsession to be the best came from our cousin's beatings when we were kids. Dad taught him how to channel his anger into fighting. Liam had permanently scarred him both mentally and physically. He had a scar just below his left eye. Rowan was overly obsessed with bringing down Uncle Wes because it meant killing our cousin. But Dad told us to bide our time. Fee was our second best fighter. I enjoyed watching her whooping our brother's ass. I was more comfortable with a knife. I could still fight, easily defending myself, but I felt better with a blade or gun in my hands. As I grew up, I stopped feeling emotion completely. Expect the unexpected our parents would nail into our heads. Mom tried to catch me off guard when I was still half asleep, only for me to shoot around right past her head. Shooting was like muscle memory now. I was exactly what she wanted me to be. I didn't hesitate. She didn't say anything, but I knew my mom was proud. Eighteen years old arrived, and on the day of our murder, I was ready. Mom still insisted on us attending school, so I was making my way home. 03052024. The same uneasy thought had been twisting my stomach all day. I was going to die at 4.50 p.m. I glanced at my phone. Nothing from my parents, so my siblings were good. Quetro 46. There was someone following me. By the shape of the shadow, it was a man. Middle-aged. Trench coat. Definitely alone and didn't seem to have a phone. Another glance at my phone. 447. There was a text from my friend that I ignored. Why did you leave school early, dumb bitch? It's... I swiped it away, stuffing my phone in my pocket. Closer. This was it. Poppy? The man's voice tickled the back of my neck. His voice was low, almost a whisper. It is Poppy, isn't it? His steps started to quicken. Could I talk to you? I felt almost intoxicated, excited with the idea of taking down my killer. My breaths were heavy. Closer. Twisting around, my hands were already wrapped around the butt of my gun. Just like my mother taught me. Bang. With one shot, he was dead. Thankfully, we lived in the middle of nowhere, so there was nobody around. I dropped to my knees next to his body, my hands shaking. First, I checked his pocket. Cigarettes, a lighter, and a leather-bound notepad. I threw all of that away, my hands landing on an envelope. Curious, I emptied it only to find multiple pictures of smiling children. All of them had giant red X's drawn over their faces, and among them photos of me, Rowan, and Ophelia. So my would-be murderer was a creep after all. Still, I killed him. I jumped to my feet, unable to resist a shriek of excitement. I almost cried, my chest heaving. Mom and Dad had turned us into killers, but crying felt so fucking good. Human. When I got home, I greeted my family in song. Mom! I stepped out of my shoes, unloading my gun. Guess what? I did a little dance. I killed my killer! I was halfway across the threshold when I felt it. Something wet, warm, leaking under my socks. It had been almost five years since I felt that sensation. Creepy crawlies skittering up my spine and filling my mouth. My eyes followed the scarlet puddle, finding my sister's body twisted and mangled out of shape. Her hands had been snapped off, her legs impossibly bent like a monster had chewed her up and spat her back out in disjointed pieces. In front of me, my mother was standing with Rowan's headless torso over her shoulder, a wide smile across her lips, polluted eyes resembling nothing staring back. My sweet mother wearing her heart-shaped apron was a monster. My brother's eyes had been burned from his sockets, his mouth carved from his face almost resembling a manic skeletal grin. A single glance at the clock on the wall told me it was 4.49 p.m., which couldn't be right. Mom. Dropping my backpack, I ducked to grab the knife sandwiched in my sock. Mom's smile was bright and yet so fucking inhuman. You didn't even hesitate, I'm so proud. Before something cold and cruel sliced across my throat. Dad, what did I say? Dad chuckled in my ear. Expect the unexpected. I woke up hanging off my father's shoulder. Bleeding out, my breath strangled, my words nonsensical. Around us. 
There was nothing. We were no longer inside our house. There was only a single bright light illuminating a giant pit in the ground. Dad spoke to me while hauling my brother's body into the chasm. He waited a moment before letting out a disappointed sigh. Your mother and I found something a long time ago when we were working as field agents. He hummed. It promised us money and power. As long as we allowed it to consume. Mom kicked Ophelia into the pit with a disgusted snort. It promised us children as strong and powerful as us. Children who could take over the family business and continue to feed it. Long after we were gone. Heirs that could fight alongside us. Mom continued. But of course, we are yet to find them. She grabbed me, dragging my body across the ground. Perhaps if you actually trained properly, Poppy. Maybe you and your siblings could have been exceptions. I only heard her latter words. Oh well, perhaps the next orphans will be better. Before she flung me over the edge where I just managed to cling on, I waited to bleed out, to lose consciousness and drop into oblivion. But after five minutes of using all of my upper body strength to hang on, I risked grazing my fingers over my throat. I could still feel the wound, but it didn't feel like it was gaping anymore. Somehow, the pit that had swallowed my siblings had healed me. Mom and Dad left after a while of waiting. By that time, I had enough strength to haul myself onto solid ground. For a moment, I stared at the ceiling, panting for breath. I rolled into my stomach and grasped for my knife, but it was gone. Fuck! When I turned to run, the pit grumbled, the ground trembling underneath my feet. Twisting around, I instinctively reached for a weapon, but I was losing my breath all over again. When a single hand appeared, grasping onto the ground for dear life, a second hand and I was stumbling back. Someone or something was crawling out. I started toward the pit before running footsteps sent me stumbling back. Mom appeared, Dad following behind her. We've been feeding potential Delacroix heirs to this thing for fifty years, and now it responds. I didn't stay behind to let them test their luck with me again. Following the tunnel back into our house, I made it back into daylight, into fresh air. I've been keeping a low profile for the last few weeks. I can't sleep, I can't eat, my hands are shaking, all I see is the pit. Those psychos pretended to be my parents. I'm terrified of being captured again. I can't stop shaking. I'm fucking alone. Last night, I heard the Delacroix children killed my parents' main rivals. I guess Rowan and Ophelia really are officially part of the family business. I wanted to be a Delacroix. But I'm so glad I ran. I can't help but wonder. If I was eaten by that thing, would it accept me too? Would it spit me out as a pure Delacroix heir? I guess I'll never know. For context, I met Thomas when we were randomly assigned to be roommates our freshman year of college. Nothing seemed to be off with him back then. Yeah, he was out a lot and came back late at night. But I always figured he was just having fun with friends. It's not like I wasn't doing the same. We had four semesters of living on campus. Two years. In that time, he never struck me as particularly eccentric. Maybe a few little things like how he never put any food in our mini-fridge, but nothing that warranted genuine concern. It wasn't until we moved into an apartment that things started to become strange. I moved in about a week after he did, a few days before classes were going to start. I was supposed to come in at the same time, but my aunt died and I needed to help my dad with some aftermath there. It would have kept me longer had the start of the semester not snuck up, but that's beside the point. We viewed the apartment together initially, and it was a pretty nice cozy place. Not exactly modern, but sure as hell cheap enough to make it worth it without said price being shady. Neither of us were bothered. But when I was finally able to move in, the place looked worse for the wear somehow. Significant enough that I noticed immediately. The pain in some places had started chipping severely, something Thomas didn't even react to when I pointed out. The floors were mostly fine but a few of the boards creaked particularly loud, which I hadn't noticed at our viewing. Again, enough that it bothered me, and still not enough for Thomas to give a damn about it. Then there was the fact that the lock to the remaining bedroom, mine, was broken. A problem not very easily fixable on a college budget. I asked Thomas about that one, making sure he actually answered me, but he just kind of shrugged it off and told me he hadn't noticed it. 
But still, okay, whatever. Weird, but probably not a big deal besides losing our security deposit. It didn't matter. The semester started, and the weeks progressed. And that was when I started noticing things about Thomas. Living in an apartment instead of a dorm was the most distant he'd ever been. It's not like he was ever super talkative, but now it seemed like he'd only glance my way and move on, unwilling to do more. In fact, he only really talked to me if it was to snap at me about being clean or quiet. With the former, he was only a little bit of a clean freak back in our dorm, incessant about his own side, but he only got really pressed about it if any of my mess seeped into his. Here and now, though, it really shined through how bad it was. He never touched my room, or anything, but the rest of the apartment had to be spotless or he'd be pissed. A few times more recently, he's thrown out my stuff because I hadn't touched it in too long, whatever that means. Nothing devastating, but one of those things was a spare charger I had to dig out of the trash and then get sprayed down with Febreze for. Nothing short of annoying is what I'm getting at here. Why he suddenly became really anal about it was anyone's guess at that point. As for the being quiet part, that was an entirely new issue. Thomas never gave a damn if I was loud while playing a game before. But suddenly now, it was worth slamming my door open without knocking over. I asked him to maybe be a little more polite about the issue when it came up. But I was again sort of just brushed off. Still, it rubbed me the wrong way how suddenly angry he was getting about the issue. Yes, it was my fault and I got better about it. But what the hell was with the switch up? Yet, I still just wrote it off. Maybe he had some mental or emotional stuff going on he didn't want to talk about. I could be patient with him. Sure, but it got worse. A roommate who clearly labels what food is his in the fridge is nothing to be mad about. Still, a few weeks into the year, I did a deep clean of the refrigerator. One that, to be fair, I had meant to do as soon as I moved in. But, it was too late for that. And now I had to take everything out to scrub it down. Only a few things were his, most of them in the freezer. I took them out, setting them aside to clean it up quickly so nothing went bad. Probably no reason to worry about that, but whatever. Once I was done, I was checking over everything as I put it back in when I noticed something with his name on it had an especially pungent smell. It was awful enough that it made my nose instinctively wrinkle up. I put it back down, hastily shoving everything else back into the fridge before turning to it. Nothing really weird, just a piece of meat in tight saran wrap that looked to be still a little bloody. Frowning, I started unwrapping it to make sure Thomas hadn't put rotten meat in the freezer. The odor only got more foul as I did. It was a smell difficult to describe, though it was what I was worried about, it didn't smell like rotting meat. It just smelled like death. Before I actually unwrapped the whole thing, it had a lot of layers, something I only questioned after the fact Thomas came home and stopped dead in the doorway. Why are you touching my shit? He stormed over after a second, snatching the meat off the table and immediately starting to rewrap it. His hands were shaking. It smells disgusting, man, I told him stepping back a little. I wanted to check it wasn't rotten. It's not, I'm on a diet, he snapped. Don't take my food. I wasn't taking it, I hissed back. Don't touch it. Thomas stuffed the meat back into the freezer at that, then swiftly retreated to his room, barely opening the door and sliding through, leaving me to scrub my hands of that horrible stench. It was then that I really got suspicious of Thomas. The other weird things layered onto that incident that made me start observing him closer. I wasn't trying to stalk my roommate by any means, but looking past the surface made me notice some more things. How half the creaking boards were in front of his room, how he always slipped into his room like he was hiding something in there. That most of his labeled food had that same disgusting odor of death when I checked. Well, Sniff tested them. After the first time, I was a little scared to unwrap another one. Maybe it was stupid. But I'd read online somewhere that a reason for creaking floorboards could be that they had recently been lifted up. So another little investigation started. This one intentional. When Thomas left for class, I started checking under the boards and it wasn't long before I turned up something. A handsaw, off-putting thing to be hidden under my feet, to say the least. It looked pretty well worn, clean, but used. 
Aside from the saw, lifting the board let me see a mysterious reddish-brown blotch stained into the underside of it. That was enough for me to put the board back and stop thinking about it for now. At least until I could come up with a plan. I had a film major buddy, and I managed to convince him to let me use an old video camera of his for science. I hid it in a plant, and aimed it at the door to Thomas's bedroom at leg level. Set up to stay at said friends for the night, and then let it play out. In hindsight, a mediocre video camera was a really shitty pick for this. But it did the job enough. I didn't get a live feed or anything, and I was left to wallow in anxiety the whole night. But when I got back while Thomas was out the next day, I could dig the camera out and watch what it showed me. After charging it, anyway, it caught eight hours of footage before dying. Most of it was nothing, which I sped through until Thomas was suddenly pulling up the floorboard. I jumped back and let the video play. Thomas walked into frame, emotionlessly kneeling down and yanking the floorboard up, pulling the handsaw out and putting it down again. He walked into his room, seemingly stowing it away, then left again for another hour or so. When he came back, there was a woman our age with him. They were talking quietly enough that the video camera didn't pick up the words, but I could make a guess what it was about. They disappeared into his bedroom, the lock clicking loudly. It remained quiet for another moment, before the worst, most horribly unsurprising sound met my ears. A woman's scream being cut short. I could barely watch the next two hours of footage, all that remained before the camera died. But I did. I sat there in horror watching Thomas's legs walk between his bedroom, the kitchen, and the door over and over again. Bringing things. Wrapping up pieces of meat. At one point near the end. Stopping to sit at the table and eat something. I could only guess what. I think typing this out has helped me process it a little, but Thomas is going to be home from his class soon. I'm kind of terrified to leave the room when he's here. I'm worried he knows that I've got him figured out, or at least under enough suspicion to warrant police involvement. I can't confront him. That's a horrible idea, but I think I hear his keys jingling, so I'm going to have to pass him if I want to go to the cops. Wish me luck. If there's no update, well, you know what happened to me.